Derek Mitzvah Secha, Mitzvah's Vidur Tshuva, the Mitzvah of Vidur and Confession. We learned that the Mitzvah of Confession of Vidur is its own Mitzvah. It is not specifically contingent upon a sacrifice or the Holy Temple in Jerusalem or anything like that. It's a positive commandment to verbalize when we have transgressed. To say that the Mitzvah of Tshuva is a process and the process must process correctly for the process to effectuate correctly. What is the process of Tshuva? First, Aziva Sachet, abandoning sin. I will never go there again. Accompanied with deep harata, remorse, shame, regret, etc. Then we get to the confession part of verbalizing what was wrong. And and once that has all been done properly, now Bakash is Mechila, which is asking for forgiveness. The author Rabbi tells that if a person transgresses, their action creates a body, some sort of entity, and this entity has some sort of soul enlivening aspect, which is created by the desire that was felt in the moment of transgression. The mitzvahs are called mitzvahs Havaya, they're connected to this name of Havaya. We are also rooted in the name of Havaya. So when we act, we draw down the light of Havaya into the world through the whole system of the ten attributes, etc. etc. When we do everything we're supposed to do, Tabim Tia and Mavala Kecha, we are complete with God, then the whole spiritual ecological system, everything flows correctly and everything goes to where it's supposed to go. This divine energy that we draw down, it enlivens the world, it nourishes the world. For this, the world was created, so it also sustains the world. This light that we draw down, the light of the mitzvahs. Remember also what we did in the Sikha of Noach, I think it was in that Sikha, but we learned about how when the Torah was given, the world kind of trembled and held its breath because were the Jews going to say yes or no? If they weren't going to say yes, then that nullifies the whole reason for existence and everything just goes back to nothingness. They're going to say yes and that perpetuates, that's going to keep existence existing. So we see that everything was made for this. As we act, we draw down this light, the mitzvahs that we draw down in a healthy spiritual sense or someone does what they're not supposed to do they puncture like a bleeding wound a bleeding organ is what results from it which is part of why when we speak about tshuva we call tshuva as healing brings healing to the world we see it as relates to here because we have to basically sanitize the wound we have to stem the blood flow heal the wound and then we can move on from it if a person transgresses also it's not just that the light of God is like it's an exile it can't be its real self it's a great humiliation because something that's so high gets dragged down so low putting the king's face in privy filth it doesn't matter how long it's for just any moment of it is utter humiliation. If a person transgresses, they hover around him, cause difficulties for him, problems for him. All the more reason to get rid of all of it. So when God says in the verse of Isaiah that I'm going to erase everything, all your transgressions like a cloud, so how do you make that happen? Because we have a body and a soul, we have to undo both of them. The body gets undone, it was created through an action, so action will undo this. In theory, we'd have to relive the situation, prove that we will not do that action again. Or so miss the chance to do it, so they have to prove that they're not going to miss that chance again. But either way, in theory, we'd have to relive the situation and act differently. Instead, God allows a verbal articulation to count as action and that undoes the body then also to undo the soul that's where the remorse the regret the harata comes in to undo the pleasure that was felt again part of why the process has to process correctly you want to take the whole tick out we can't have partial anything or else we haven't fully rectified part of also why true was such a great kindness from god that god allows us this that eventually led us to the verse of eskar. ah yes i and he who erases your transgressions why does it have two times anochi anochi it's talking about two levels of keser the levels of keser is the level of a crown that is level above the ten attributes and Kesser is the intermediary between or and so of God's infinite light and the light that comes down into the world. That's the bridge, the adapter section. What is within Kesser that we have in Anochi twice? There's two levels. Ratzon and Tainug. Want, desire, and delight. And these two are in the crown because they are overriding, motivating factors. They can control everything. They can take over the whole body, these two. When we look closer what these two levels of Kesser are, we see there are two levels that's called Atik Yemen, which is the higher level, the level of delight. That is the lowest level of the emanator. You have to have some sort of contracted light for it to be able to come in. Arachanpin, the source of the emanator, that is the starting point, that is the source for the 10 attributes to follow. We need to tap into both of these levels to rectify what was done. Attic is called removed from the days. It's so high up, it's past the point of creation, it's not even connected to the six emotive attributes, the building blocks of creation. And our seems also so far away. Well, Attic seems like such a wonder because it's so high above everything. It's this great light that can't be taken in. Our seems so far away past the Sea of Chachmo because it's the source of the emanation, so it's the starting point. So both of these seems like two high, inaccessible sort of levels. So it's wondrous levels. How can we even access them? Attic Yemen, because it's such a bright light, when it's draw down and blies the eyes of the extraneous forces, of the negative forces, and it makes them run away. That basically sanitizes the wound, that there's no more bacteria there anymore, so that we can begin the healing process. They can't handle light. And Arach Atpin, because that's at the source of everything, we now draw it down so that it could fix the blemishes. That's why Teshuva is called Tosh of Hay, returning the Hay. Hay is indicative, we spell it out, Hay and Yud, is indicative of the two levels of Chachma and Bina through Bina, deep contemplation of who have I sinned against. That is going to awaken deep within the recesses of the heart, it's going to awaken the love and digging deep within ourselves. That's in Chachma and that will then lead to the rectification process. Because like a dry river, we have to dig deep to get water again. So we have to dig deep in order to go higher. Even though we say, oh, we're drawing on Kesser, we're really going to level above that, which is Adam Kadman, the primeval man. That's the place where all of creation from start to finish is realized in one go. So all things being equal, all things being perfect, up in Adam Kadman. So when we access that level, that is a panacea level that can cure everything because ultimately that's where everything is complete up there. That returns us to the verse of Kiyam Mitzvah, so Shara Nechem Safchayo, Lone Place Mimcha, Lo Hoki, this mitzvah, this particular mitzvah that I command, 
you. It's not hidden from you and it's not far away. This mitzvah we're speaking about, why do we have it as, as a singular which particular mitzvah we're talking about? We're talking about the mitzvah of Chuba. What do you mean that it's, it's not beyond you, it's not hidden from you and it's not far away? Because this optic, which is so wondrous, it's such a pella. Like, what is this level of optic? How could someone access it? And Arich, which seems so far, it seems impossible to be able to access these levels. But the verse of the Torah tells us very specifically that for you, for you specifically, it's not far away. You can access it, you can tap into it, and you can effectuate as it can do. Because Chuba is so accessible to you, you can use Chuba to do what needs to be done. Ultimately, how could you use because we're really drawing down from Adam Kadman. A malach, an angel, only has one job. It can only be given one task. It is not a multitasker. It's very singularly designed. Jewish people, on the other hand, we have 613 tasks. All the mitzvahs that we were given. We have multiple things that we've been commanded to do. All things that we contain all of creation in it. Because come from this level of Adam Kadman, where all things being equal and all things being perfect and all the same. Angels are created from a lower level than that. But because that's where we're being drawn from, we have the power to be able to rectify. And that brought us to this verse from the Amidah of saying, forgive us our father because we sinned. That's not a reason for forgiveness. That's the reason why we have to ask for forgiveness, not the reason why we should be forgiven. Actually, in truth, it really is because of the verse that comes before it. Bring us back to you in wholehearted tshuva. When we will dig deep to go higher, we can now access a whole new level. And through that, we say, God, forgive us. Now that we have access this whole new level, this only came about because of the transgression. And that's not what we're coming to now to ask for forgiveness. God has a will that you should do to our mitzvahs. When the moment comes, in the day, in the minute, or whatever it is to do it, that's your one chance to get it done. If the time passes, you miss that one particular chance. That will that was given to you in that moment is removed. So you can't get that will back again. And yet we're coming after we've gone through the whole uh, cleansing process. We've gone through the whole awakening moment and the deep regret time. We're like, God, give us another chance. Well, I can't go back in time for you anymore and I have to give you a will, but I can't just operate anymore on the level that we're operating at because that's the level where there's the blemish. Instead, we have to go to a level higher than that. So we draw down a whole new will, a higher will, which is how we get to the idea that a penitent, Baal Tshuva, someone who repents, stands at a higher level than a tzaddik because a tzaddik operates on the level of the mitzvah savaya. He does everything he's supposed to do. He does the mitzvah that they should be done. His whole experience of the mitzvah is also a totally different dimension, but he never makes the mistake. He doesn't risk the separation from God, God forbid. He doesn't exile the uh, divine spark. There's no privy full of filth or anything like that. Everything operates on the mitzvah sabaya and everything is good and complete. Someone who transgresses is someone who was lowered through the transgression. To get out of it, the rectification brought him up to a higher level because you access something that was higher than what the mitzvah sabaya could access. The same way that we need the higher light to rectify what, what was punctured there, because you access that higher light, that brings you to that higher level. The person who's the Baal Tshuva is now on the higher level than where the Tzaddik stands. That's where we got it to last time. This is a little bit more in explaining how it is that a Baal Tshuva, the penitent, stands at a higher level than a Tzaddik. This is going into Kabbalah. Kabbalah. Dainas, intentional sins, are sourced in the spheres of Tohu, a world higher than Tikkun, as seen by the Torah's account of the kings of Edom who ruled in the land first. From here come the impure klipa, which can't be accessed or elevated through the process of Burur, or the mitzvahs, so the Torah distances from them. If a person transgresses and does Tshuva, the sparks are elevated to a level higher than actions of Tadikim, as what's higher falls lower. Here we're talking about Zdonas, which are intentional sins. And it says, when you do tshuva correctly, these intentional sins, this dainas, nasa, kazachias, this dainas become like merits. Why do they become like merits? Because this which caused me to transgress is now going to be the impetus that actually leads me up to this higher level. So it now becomes a merit to me because it brought me up to a much higher level than where I was before. You don't intentionally want to do that because if a person tries to intentionally sin and will be like, oh, we're going to Kippur will forgive or I'll just go to God for forgiveness, then it, the process doesn't work the same way. And we're talking about someone who transgresses without thinking, better to ask for forgiveness than permission? Like, no. This is somebody who, for whatever reason, they messed up, but not in the sort of sense of like, oh, it's okay if I mess up because then I'll just ask for repentance. Versus, yeah, I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. So in this regard, for that person, what led them astray is now going to be what leads them up to the higher, closer level. It is like a merit to them. The Kabbalah explains how does this whole process work? Because the things that are forbidden to us, the prohibitive commandments, there's more of them than the positive commandments. The thou shalt, 248 thou shalt do. 365 prohibited. The idea there's a higher number of it seems to be like an interesting situation. Not just because God's like, no, 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 you're not going to have fun, you're not going to do anything. It's not why. It's coming from a higher place. And the same idea that we have a brick wall, what's higher, the bricks that are higher will fall lower, down. These are rooted in the, the world of Tohu. The world of Tohu, they usually translate kind of as the world of chaos. It says it in the Torah. Before we have the description of the creation of the world, it's in the second verse. Baratai says Tohu Vo. The way we explain the world of Tohu, it's a world where the lights were so great, there were no vessels to contain it. So you have this great, massive, frenetic sort of energy, but this whole thing of the spheres that we saw, these vessels didn't work for it. It was too much. It's like the difference between saying, oh, I need a cup of water. So you go to the sink and you fill yourself up with a cup of water versus going to Niagara Falls to get a cup of water. Niagara Falls is too big to be contained in this cup, which is to say, 
say that it's more powerful than the water, the pressure coming out of your sink. You could say like, oh, the sink is so much better because I can actually take a cup from there. In theory, it's better in the sense that I can interact with it. I can engage with this sink and get a cup of water from there. But Niagara Falls is so much more powerful, so much more magnificent because it's so much stronger. This world of Toad, the light, the energy of it was so much stronger. It couldn't be contained in anything. It couldn't be held. So that's why they talk about the breaking of the vessels, what tried to hold it, everything broke and shattered and the light scattered into this world and our process is of elevation. The world after Toad is the world that we call Tikkun. That's the world that we're in now. It's the world of fixing things. Kind of like Tikkun Olam, it's a world of order. Instead of having these raw, powerful, frenetic energies, the lights were dimmed, so now they could be contained. It's not just that they could be contained, they could actually interact with each other. Such so as you could have kindness and severity and severity and kindness and all these different kinds of things. If you think about it, if you've ever worked in a group before and you have very strong personalities, good luck on the teamwork aspect. Versus if you're working in a group where you could have a lot of great personalities, but if, if you don't have too many of the strong personalities, then they'll work much better in a team together. It's a generalized metaphor for what this world is. So the world of Tau, this higher level world, what we call the prohibitive commandments come from that world. They were higher up, thereby they fall lower. So in this world, by the time they reach this world, they become something that we can't access, something that we can't engage with, and something that we can't elevate. And that is why it's forbidden. So anything that this is forbidden, it's not because, oh, this is so evil, terrible. Some things are like that, but as a general idea, what's wrong with a pig? God says you can't eat pig. What's the big deal? For whatever reason, we can't elevate it in this world. Not till Mashiach comes. That is why God says it's forbidden, because your whole divine spiritual mission, your whole purpose for being here, these things will not effectuate that. These things will not help you to realize that. However, a person who transgresses went there. And now what? Now that this action has been committed, now what's supposed to happen from it? A person is not going to repent only because they fell low, they get back up again. So now they're in a higher place because of that. They're now taking these things that were once lower that really came higher, and that's the level that they're operating at. That's part of also how a penitent could come to a higher level than a tzaddik, because you're actually dealing with a light that's actually a higher level light. Down here in the world, we couldn't necessarily deal with it, but once the person went there, and now that's going to be what's going to guide them toward Shuvah and toward coming closer to God, they have now caused the elevation through this higher level of light. Which is also why you have to have the complete truth for the process to work. We see certain narratives played on the term, like, oh, look, there's the story, or here's just the narrative that's playing out. And here Kabbalah's like, no, 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 there's stuff going on here they don't necessarily understand. So this is from Boratius, where it describes, These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom, for any king reigned over the children of Israel. Before the Jewish people set themselves up in the land of Israel, there's a whole description of, he ruled, he died, he ruled, he died. And it seems like, why are you including this in the Torah right now? Bela, son of Bar, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhava. Bela died in Yovav, son of Zerachabatsu, who reigned in his stead. And Yovav died in Chushim of the land of the Temani, reigned in his stead. It goes on like this for several verses. What's going on here right now? So Kabbalah is like, this is talking about the world of Torah, a world that's not sustainable. And that's why you just have come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go, because it's not an enduring world. Once you finally have the Jewish people come in there, which is going to be the world of Tikkun taking over, this world of order taking over, now you have much more sustainability and longevity in it, because it's a world that can fit the vessels much better. Just an example from the book of Vayikra. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, none of you shall eat blood, and the stranger who sojourns among you shall not eat blood. The Bible brings the example of these are things that are forbidden to us because we cannot elevate them. However, they come really from a higher level. Speak to children of Israel, saying, shall not eat any fat, but not sheep or goat. Even the kosher animals are certain parts of them that we don't eat. All this just to substantiate what we're saying here about how Baal Tshuva, sound of just Tshuva reaches a higher level because they're taking what seems to have been lower, but really came higher, and there's a whole elevation that's going to occur now with it. Which brings us back to Rabbi Chana Bar said, great is Tshuva as it brings healing to the world. As stated, I will heal their waywardness or their backsliding. I will love them freely. Just from Hosea. Teaching that repentance from sin brings healing. Tshuva, as we've described, brings healing. First, we already had it because we got a wound. We have a puncture that has to be healed. Now we're going to bring in a new example of how Tshuva connects to healing. Tshuva is healing. A healthy person doesn't need medicine. In fact, it's not healthy for a healthy person to just randomly take medicine. But when needed, a small amount is significantly more potent in strengthening the body than large amounts of food, wine, oil, which the body can't take in. Medicine, anything that's made out of a curative, is extremely powerful. It's like when poisons are kind of the antidote to certain things. Extremely, extremely powerful. You can't take it in great quantities. You can only have a little bit of it. But that little bit is enough to heal a person. More than what you get out of regular standard healthy food. It's not the same eating 17 oranges as taking something that would be much more concentrated and pointed than that. We have the verse of Tehillim, Yeshach Nevar Birpaim Bimalab Mishchei Sosam. He sent his word and healed them and extricated them from their pit. What does it mean he sent his word and healed them? His word are the letters and word of Hashem which bring curatives into existence. God spoke the world into being. Everything exists by the word of God. Literally, there's letters that form everything. When a person receives from them, he is healed by the word of Hashem within, which is more powerful than that invested in food. Medicine, which you only take a little bit in, what's in it is much more powerful. The divine light that's in it is much more powerful than what is in regular standard food. So you say, oh, so everybody should just be taking the medicine. No, medicine is very specifically for a sick person. It's not something that just anybody takes in. And when you take it in, you only take it in the small amounts. You're not supposed to take it in great quantities. This example is being brought down to show us also this dynamic of teshuva, the healing power of teshuva. There's a picture there because 
because it brings in the mimer. It says, for example, like, uh, shoot, sarsaparilla. Is that what it's called? You can get the root of it still. It is a curative. So the mimer brings that down. Sarsaparilla, sarsaparilla, whatever it is. Okay, talking about the letters of Hashem's name. This is from Shari Yechad Ben Munos, the second section of Tanya. We're the letters that constitute the divine utterance to depart from the ferment, it revert to the state of never having existed at all. God's word literally keeps the world in existence or else everything would just be nothingness. No CGI, slow fade. No SFX, no special effects, no nothing. Just absolute nothingness, the same as it was before. And so it is with all created things in all the upper and lower worlds and even this physical earth and the realm of the completely inanimate. This is not just for the world itself. Everything is kept in existence through the word of God. The Baal Shem Tos says, Hashem Forever, O Lord, your word stands firm in the heavens. We don't just mean as a metaphorical sense of that God is eternal. We mean literally God's word keeps the heavens up there. And here the author is saying this is for everything. Inanimate to the animate. Everything is kept alive by the word of God. Even immobile beings that show no signs of animation or spirituality, not even to the degree observed in the process of growth in the vegetative world, even this extremely low life form constantly harbors within it the divine life force that brought it into being. Where is the life form in a rock? But there is, or else the rock wouldn't be here. It's also interesting because when you look at the four categories, the four kingdoms, we usually say inanimate, but we've seen this before. Domit Smechai Madaber. Inanimate, for lack of a better term, really means silent. Growth, the growth plant kingdom. Animals and man. So we say, oh, man's at the top of the food chain. But really, what is Domim silent because the life force in it, you can't tell it's silent. That actually sustains everything above it. And that's part of the idea of what's higher falls lower. The water, minerals, all these things that they seem to be like, we walk all over them and we just kind of take advantage of them. We don't see them as life forms because down here, that's how they manifest. But up there, they came from a much higher place. Part of how we know this is because those lower things sustain everything. They sustain plants, which sustain animals, which sustain humans. Nothing above it can exist without that basic category. So if the letters of the 10 utterances by which the earth was created during the six days of creation were to depart from it, but for an instant, God forbid, it would revert to naught and absolute nothingness, exactly as before the six days of creation. Just nothing. Absolute nothingness. This thought was expressed by Rizal when he said that even within that which appears to be utterly inanimate matter, such as stones or earth or water, there's a soul and spiritual life force, and that will sustain the kingdoms above it. That is, i.e., although they evince no demonstrable form of animation, within them are nevertheless enclosed the letters of speech from the ten utterances which give life and existence to inanimate matter, enabling it to come into being out of the naught and nothingness that preceded six days of creation. The ten utterances bring inanimate matter into a state of existence from a former state of non-being prior to the six days of creation. Thus, the letters of the ten utterances create inanimate matter are its soul and life force. This is being brought in because it's talking here about how medicine, Yishtach Debar, that he sends his word. His word are the letters and the light that are within. Here, we're specifically talking about curative, the healing agent that's in it. We're seeing that God sustains everything through his speech and through his word and through his letter. Through a teshuva, intentional sins, which fell from their source in Tohu, are transformed to a level higher than the mitzvahs of tzaddikim. Culminating this section, that which was lower came from higher. And through tshuva, the entire thing is transformed. Thus, all blemishes are healed by the higher light drawn down from Atak and Narach Anpin, which in turn draw down from Adam Kadma. Because that which was higher fell lower, and through a person engaging that, that will now compel them to reach higher. You are now accessing this much higher level. These higher levels, because of what they are and where they are, they are healing agents that can fix everything that was messed up. Which in turn draw down from Adam Kadma, functioning as overall Kesar, the will of wills, man's spiritual source. Because ultimately, we don't just call from God's will, we call from the source of God's will. We don't just come from will itself, which would be Araf, we come from the will of wills, rhyme and deriving, which is love of Adam Kadma. We really come from the higher, higher level. We could take what down here in this world seems to have been something so negative and seems to have been such a terrible thing that was done and we could transform it and turn it into something that will be a benefit to us, acts as a merit to us, when we process the process correctly, which is going to lead us to a whole new section. So we'll end off here. Now that we've said all this, now that we've learned everything about Shuva and how incredible it is and how when we process the process correctly, how we can heal everything, we could heal the wound, puncture that was created, we could rectify to the extent that God will just erase it like it never was. Was. One thing that we have to know about all this, this incredible level of tshuva, this incredible kindness that God did for us, tshuva and its wondrous qualities are only effective in this world. The tshuva is for this physical realm. It is not something that can be done in the higher realms. Specifically, it can be done here in this lifetime. Once a person passes, what tshuva can do is not accessible to them anymore. So this is the world where we can make things happen. This is the world where we can actually transform at such an incredible level, something that seems to have been so negative and something that seems to have been such a detriment and something that seems to have been such a, a strike against us. This world is a world world that we could actually transform it to actually be a merit toward us.